our December training, we're going to change the format to a Q&A with Dr. Hodnick looking at two different topics. The addition of the femoral IO placement and the removal of long backboards. So we'll stump in. Uh, first, we'll do femoral IO. So Dr. Hodnick, uh, why are we adding femoral IO? Awesome. So honestly, the, the, the big reason is to actually make your life easier at the end of the day, because what this is going to do is this is going to add a third site that you can use. Now it is going to be the preferred site, but of course we're still going to have humeral and tibial as options, but you're, I think you guys are really going to like the femoral site because it has a lot of advantages and really at the end of the day is it gets a lot easier. Essentially, you can't miss it. I mean, it's the biggest bone in the body, right? So we're going from, you know, big bones in the body to the absolute biggest bone in the body that we're going to use now is our preferred site. It's also flat. There's no other bones around it. And again, you can't miss it. The other nice advantage to it, since it's a big, thick bone with a big, thick cortex, is it's very difficult to dislodge, which is a huge advantage, especially over the humeral site, which has problems uh, in terms of dislodgement, bending, and all kinds of good things like that. The femur is large, so again, trying to drill through it is, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but it's a lot harder to do it, right? Because if I say you can't do it, somebody will do it. The cool thing about it, too, is the flow rate basically is the same as the humeral head, which is pretty high at 105 mLs per minute. That's pretty darn good. And the nice thing, too, is if you're working this in a cardiac arrest, you're out of the way, right? Because you're now at the bottom of the body, and everybody else is going to be doing all their airway, chest compressions at the top of the body. So it really gets you out of the way and gets you those same flow rates that the humerus gets, which is in the way. Awesome. I just want to quickly review uh, IO needle selection. So remember, the needle colors are based on length and they're not for a specific population. So blue is not for adults, rather blue indicates a 25 millimeter needle length. Also, all of the needles are 15 gauge. The only thing that changes from colors is the length. On each needle, there are horizontal black lines that indicate five millimeter sections. So for selection, all you have to do is, once you've inserted the needle through the skin before you start drilling, is if there's at least one horizontal black line outside of the skin, you can continue using that. There is enough to get through the cortex into the marrow space for the IO to work correctly. All right, so Ryan, will you go over the specifics, uh, sorry, the specifics of the distal femur insertion? Yeah, so again, like I said, the, we're dealing with the biggest bone in the body, so that makes it easy to find it, right? When we do this, it's gonna be the distal femur that we're using, and unlike its uh, cousin, the humerus and the tibia, you're gonna be drilling into a flat surface, which is gonna, again, make your life easier. So the way we're gonna locate the site that we're gonna stick this in is you're gonna find the patella, which is pretty easy to find on anybody, and what you're going to do is you're going to go two centimeters above or think two finger widths and you're going to basically going to drill straight down right into the bone it's very simple it's a big surface that you're drilling into it's going to be drilling like a, into a two by four at the end of the day very similar the thing to remember is if you're dealing with somebody with a femur fracture and it's on that leg not a good choice we're not going to stick it in there same with the thing if there's a hip fracture or anything like that now you could use the other side the contralateral side but don't use the side that's broken for your access, right? That just kind of makes sense and should be intuitive. But we always like to remind everybody that, especially in the heat of battle, right? And again, drugs, same drugs as any other IO site. All of them can go in there. Don't overthink it. Blood, fluids, all that good stuff can go in there. And again, you're going to get those nice good flow rates in the femur. Awesome. Okay. So now moving on to uh, backboard removal. Uh, can you break down the reasoning for removing backboards? Yeah, so here's another kind of cool and exciting thing. We're, we're basically getting rid of backboards as an immobilization device. They're not going away completely, and we'll talk about that in a second, but we're not going to be immobilizing patients with backboards because really we'll go into a little bit of history on this, but this came about in the 1960s. It was actually an orthopedic surgeon who came up with this idea that if you put people on these hard boards that you could prevent fractures and secondary injuries, and we actually know that today not to be the case. It took a while to figure that out, but it doesn't prevent any further fractures or anything like that. We do know, though, that it causes breakdown of the skin. It causes pressure injuries, 
And anybody who's ever been put on the backboard knows if your back didn't hurt prior to being put on the backboard, it's going to hurt once you're on the backboard for any period of time. So it's just really not a good device for what it was initially intended for. And there's lots of literature and evidence that it doesn't do anything except actually cause problems. We are still going to maintain cervical collars. That's not going away. What's really going to replace the backboard on the truck is going to be your striker cot in the stretcher. It is basically going to serve as the backboard. You're going to place the patient on there. It's a lot softer. You're going to strap them in just the same way you normally would. Nothing changes there. What we're going to use the backboards for, because again, they're not going to go way off the truck, is you're going to use it as a device to basically extricate people and move people maybe from one spot to another, maybe the scene of a crash and to get them on your ambulance just because it's a little bit easier to handle the patient, but we're not going to keep them strapped on there in the truck and transporting them that way. That's just not what we're going to do. All right, sweet. Uh, last thing, uh, let's say we arrive maybe second unit in to mutual aid and we're taking a patient from another agency and they're already on um, full spinal precautions, you know, long board, spider straps. Should we leave them on there? Should we take them off? What should we do? Yeah, that's a really good question because, I mean, you are going to run into this and obviously other agencies that you're going to deal with are going to have different protocols and, and they'll be at different levels of training. We don't want to insult them and, you know, say, hey, what are you doing wrong there? What you're going to do is take the patient, put them in your the back of your truck, go ahead and leave them on the board initially, and then we're going to take them off on the striker cot, get them off the board and get them comfortable. And the patient will definitely thank you for that. So you can just, again, use it as a device to move the patient from A to B. Just don't leave them on there. But the patient will be much happier with you too, I promise you, once you move them from the backboard to the uh, striker cot, if they're awake. All right, perfect. I uh, think that wraps it up. I wanted to provide one piece of evidence for the removal of spinal boards. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and read this. Spinal immobilization with the long spinal board is ineffective, has detrimental side effects, and came into initial use by consensus. The National Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Emergency Physicians have both recommended limiting the use of the long spinal board and moving from spinal immobilization to spinal mobile restriction with a rigid cervical collar. The National Association of EMS Physicians Physician Paper and Supporting Resource Document stated that a patient with neurological deficit and spinal pain or tenderness may be placed on the long spine board, but the long spine board should be considered an extrication device only and the patient must be removed from the long spine board as soon as possible. For those who want to read the whole thing, the evidence is there. Um, there are lots of pieces of evidence out there. It's just one good example. I wanted to summarize the points that were made in this video. First, FEMRIO. Remember, this is an addition to the existing sites. Now, it is the preferred site, so please use this primarily, but it is an addition. You have the other options. One piece that we missed in the video that I wanted to add is to make sure that the patella is 90 degrees to whatever the patient's laying on. If the patella is rotated out, it's possible that the femur, the flat section that we're talking about where you'll be drilling, is turned and you could potentially miss, although not likely. If you do 90 degree patella to the ground, it's basically not, not a problem. Next, the backboard. When removing backboard, please do not be afraid to take people off of backboards. So will be in your guidelines is obviously backed by Dr. Hodnick. So you have the backing on it. Please remove people from backboards. It does not help. It only hurts. If you find people on backboards, do not be afraid to remove them. Still use them for extrication. Still use it to move people around, but just don't leave them on it. This concludes the femoral IO and backboard update video.